So I'm a TESOL professor and I, I work with graduate students and doctoral students, uh, but I, I started off as a secondary school teacher and somewhere in between I started writing textbooks. Um, this is a column from Powell's Books in uh, Portland and actually I kind of looked at it uh, when I was looking for an image for the opening one and I thought, hey, this kind of, you know, it's about books, but then when I looked closer I thought, hey, it's also about me. And the reasons it's about me is because at the very top there's some Arabic and I lived in the Middle East for a couple of years. I was chair of assessment and uh, liberal studies for the college system there. It says Hamlet is next. And uh, my my uh, master's degree was not in linguistics, was not in education. It was actually in uh, theater as a playwright. There's some Chinese there. And I lived in Hong Kong and uh, China for 16 years uh, teaching. And then finally, at the bottom, it says Vende Librum and uh, Carpe Librum, which I think you probably know Vende. It means to uh, sell books and to, and to get books or see books right so it seems to be a very sort of biographical about me so anyway let's start off from there um, I wanted to start off and uh, now see if I can get this uh, controls oh, nah. okay now this is where this is where we find out the controls don't work okay 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 they're just a little bit slow okay let's see okay so I was asked to put in a little bit of a uh, uh, a questionnaire for you and a very simple one because we have polling on this site. Uh, so uh, I wanted to know a little bit about you as an audience and why do you want to write? Because I imagine that many people coming this evening for tonight's presentation are curious about uh, getting into writing themselves, maybe doing more if they've already started or finding out how to start off or something. So I think you have three choices here and it might be A, B or C. I'm not I'm sorry, I'm not sure where the polling is, but uh, but if you can find your polling there, then you can uh, go ahead and vote. Um, are we getting any? Let's see. There we are, A, B, and C. Okay, so instead of uh, one, two, three, A, B, and C. So go ahead, go ahead and, uh, and put that in if you're not too shy, yeah. Uh, a, B, or C, I'm not seeing anybody. <laughs> All right, okay, maybe I don't have, to, maybe I'm not setting it up there. Um, Okay, well, let's let's just imagine that there's the even spread here. <laughs> One and two. Okay, we're getting it coming up in the sides. Okay, so lots of people are uh, very altruistic. Uh, uh, not so many fame and glory, a few. And uh, some people are coming up for about sharing ideas. Seems to be a very, very popular one. And that is an expression. That is something that is a natural thing for ESL teachers. We want to share our ideas. And, uh, and for others, it's uh, two and three. I see Monica. Thank you, Monica. Monica coming up for money and some other people coming up for money as well. Well, actually, this is what uh, Samuel Johnson said is no man but a blockhead ever wrote except for money. Now, Samuel Johnson, you know, was the, uh, who did the first dictionary in English. He compiled the first dictionary in English. And, uh, and I sort of follow this to a certain extent. But in fact, I think like most writers, I'm a mixture of all three. I do love to write for money, but I, I also have a lot of side projects, a lot of other things that I don't do for money or fame. And of course, like so many writers, I'm trying to get that uh, great Canadian novel off as well. The curious thing, though, is that it's not a diversion from what I do in my professional work as a textbook uh, writer. It actually complements it, I think, because of a number of factors that we'll explore tonight. Um, so I wanted to start off, though, with uh, the bad news, the bad news, and talk about some of the difficulties in getting into publishing. I just want to be realistic about some of the chances you might have. And uh, just so you can assess what is and what is not difficult about getting into publishing. In fact, anybody can publish. You can, you know, write something, go to the photocopy store and, and publish it. Uh, but I think if you want to reach a wider audience, both with your ideas and or for money, uh, then that's another kettle of fish. So, uh, just briefly to give some perspective here, do you remember these guys? Um, anybody know who this is? <laughs> I think it's not a difficult question if you're over 14 years old. Um, it's the Beatles, of course. And, and the Beatles, of course, in their time in the 1960s were hugely popular and hugely successful. Uh, Paul McCartney, you might be surprised to know, during his all of his time with the Beatles, though, he only uh, made $7 million. That was the total of his earnings. And of course, it was in the 1960s, so $7 million was a lot more money then. But, uh, and of course, and also, he's also uh, has, is worth $660 uh, million now. 
one of the surprising things uh, about all of these guys is that is that none of them could read or write music. Uh, so a bit of a challenge. And when you think about doing uh, being the next Beatles today, it's the uh, it's a little more daunting. Let's go forward a few years into the 1980s, uh, 1990s maybe, and uh, Jaws. Uh, I think most sorry, I'm not sure how to mute people, but if, could you please mute yourself, uh, everyone? Thanks. Um, so Jaws, most of you probably saw Jaws, uh, trembled at the movie, uh, stopped going to the beach for a while even. Jaws was enormously popular. Probably uh, uh, quite a, uh, you know, quite a lower number of you actually have seen Sharknado 5. Anybody seen Sharknado 5? Is that uh, on your best, uh, best viewing list in some way? Um, Jaws came out at a time when there was really no other shark movies. It was a new kind of a movie, totally. And it made, uh, it, it eventually made 470 million. And again, we're talking about 1990 dollars. So it was, it was a huge huge impact and uh, Sharknado 5 not so much not so much so there are kind of imitators that come along people who try to do the same things but they're not always just as, as successful at, at it um, and then we go into something and I apologize this is disgusting but it really illustrates a point and I hope I trust I know that none of you have this on your phones even though George Clooney does but it's called iFart iFart was the original fart sounds app are you kidding me? This is disgusting. This is disgusting, except for the fact that it is among the top 20 apps of all time. Are you kidding me? Uh, it just seems ridiculous to me that this was so popular. But in fact, when it came out in 2008, on Christmas Day alone, it was download. Uh, there were 40,000 downloads of this program. Uh, on average, in the first year that it came out, there was 10,000 downloads a day, a day, an enormous base for this. And it continues to sell. Uh, it was originally 99 cents, and now it's 3.99 to sort of buy this enhanced version. It is crazy. Yeah, thanks for that comment. It is absolutely crazy uh, to sort of see something like that. But it presents a moral to us, um, a moral in a couple of different ways ways. One is that it ended up with endless imitators. And so there's all sorts of things like farm farts. Really? Like, who wants that? I mean, uh, vomit noises? What, what? You know, who wants this sort of thing? But everybody is trying to cash in in the same way to get a little piece of that pie. The trouble is, the trouble with all of this is, uh, with the Beatles, with Jaws, with, you know, I fart, anything like that, is that there's a certain time and place when you can be quite successful and then you're not. And if you, uh, there's a common proverb that says, you know, what's the best time to plant a tree? A little riddle. And of course, the answer to that is 10 years ago. Uh, it's the best time to have started would have been 10 years ago. And it's the same with publishing. But I think there's a corollary or another side to this point. And that's, that is, if somebody has already planted all the trees, you don't want to plant another one. So just stop, just stop, and don't consider doing it. And this is what we sometimes see in the publishing world, is there's a very, very crowded field, and there's no, uh, there's no reason to, for others to sort of try to squeeze into it, because there simply isn't enough room. So that's part of the bad news, part of the bad news. So the first lesson, and I want to share a number of lessons as we go through, there'll be these big red exclamation marks uh, for points. Um, the first lesson is your future in publishing is probably not in the past of publishing. So you want to look for the new. You want to look for new opportunities. You want to look for something different. Before uh, before apps, there were no apps. When apps came out, it was a great time to get into it. Before uh, the Beatles, uh, there was pop, but not so much. It was a great time to get into pop. Uh, before you know shark movies, uh, that's you know those, that time has passed, and now it's better to do some other kind of movie. So really, one of the big things you want to be doing is looking for something new, some new idea. I'm seeing somebody's putting up in the comments, blogging, what a great idea. Blogging is a great idea, something new. Okay, so I wanna start off with an idea about <laughs> how are textbooks not made? How are they not made? And um, uh, uh, this is kind of interesting to look at uh, what, 
common perceptions are about textbooks because I often, you know, go to parties and uh, conferences and things like that. And people say, oh, I, I would like to be a writer. I, I, I have some great ideas and things like that. So I just wanted to share sort of some ways in which they're not made. And the number one way is um, that they're not made is they're almost never, they almost never start with someone's big idea. Um, you know, lots of people have big ideas. They might mention to it a publisher, uh, they might send an email, they might send a, a sample of something, which is, you know, a step up from that. And uh, generally, they're not done. They're not done. I have tons of ideas and I've published so many books. I, I have a great track record. Uh, and yet, uh, out of all the books that I've written, very few, very, very few were my own ideas. Um, very, very few. Once in a while, a publisher will say, will give me leeway and they'll say, okay, we're doing a book on this series. What do you think and I'll have you know 10 or 20 or 30 or 100 little ideas about improving it or making it different in some way but it's not like uh, they say Ken what would you like to write and just let me go with it so here's an example <laughs> this is a, when I say an example I say my deep failure and uh, am I bitter yes okay so uh, so this is something that I wrote with my uh, friend uh, Dr. Klaus Noss, uh, Noth um, uh, Klaus is um, Klaus is one of my best and my oldest friends. He's German, and uh, uh, in 2010, I think uh, my wife and I and our two young sons were in Paris, and uh, and he came to visit from nearby from Germany, and so uh, we were we were talking one night, uh, and uh, he was saying he was a bit worried about his own sons, and he has three. And he was saying he was worried about their lack of sort of financial knowledge and knowledge about management. And of course, so many of the issues that concerned him, he is an economist, uh, but he is a, he, now he works not in a university, but he works and uh, not in a big company, but he works as a private consultant with some of the largest corporations in the world. And he goes in and does management training and, and uh, all sorts of different types of uh, trainings based, basically related to change management. It's one of the things that he does. So anyway, we were talking about these things and he said to me, he said, Ken, we should write a book about this. And we talked about it. And I said, I said, well, you know, we could write, you're thinking about like a how-to book. And he said, oh, kids don't want to read that. And I said, well, what if we made it into a novel of some kind and things like that? So we did, we did. We spent like years writing this and uh, probably about five years. And we, I'd, I'd write a chapter and send it to him and he'd write a chapter and send it to me and he'd educate me about all the things to do with economics and I would educate him with you know what a narrative is and some stories and and gradually we put this together it's a beautiful thing it's called Z to B a teenager entrepreneur's adventure in management time travel and jazz what could be better I, I know you want it already right so what's not to like this is the story of it it's Max Z is a genius teenager struggling with his messy room and messy life when he's startled by a surprisingly bossy 15 year old girl from the future. Sophia suddenly appears to help him identify his targets and the preconditions for success, these are economic terms, uh, that will help him get there. She helps him embark on a dream project to play at a jazz festival with friends, but along the way he has to struggle with economic principles, personal management, project management, management conflict management, time management, and time travel, right? Okay, so it's great. I tell you, it's a wonderful book. I love it. I really, myself, I'm I'm a sentimental guy anyway, but I get to the end and I cry at the end. It's so sweet at the end, everything that happens and things like that. So I think this is great. This is fantastic. I love it. And so I send it to, I send it out for various publishers. What happens? Nothing, nothing happens. I send it to agents and I send it to publishers and they don't even reply. Even more embarrassing, even more embarrassing than that. I've sent this to three, three of my own publishers. These are people for whom I've sold millions of books. And and yet they won't even, they, they don't even email back, email me back to say, no, this is terrible. They absolutely go totally silent. They must be embarrassed for me. I don't know, but it doesn't fit into their publishing plan. That's fine. That's fine. Oh, I think to myself, oh, it's like, you know, it must be like, uh, must be like gone with the wind. You know, everybody knows that was rejected 38 times or it, it must be like Harry Potter. It was rejected by every British publisher. But in fact, those are two lies as well. 
Gone with the Wind was actually never rejected. It was one publisher heard about uh, that Margaret Mitchell had written this book and he went to visit her and she gave him the manuscript and he published it. That was it. Uh, so there was no 38 version, no 38 publishers. Harry Potter was rejected by 12 publishers, but I'm not sure that's true. I think that one took it up and it might have been that like three weeks later, somebody wrote to her and said, oh yeah, this is kind of interesting. And she said, no, sorry, it's already been taken. Uh, it probably, as it was the case with me, was just simply ignored, is simply ignored. And uh, of course, a great loss to them. But in my case, in my case, it's uh, there's some lessons here. The lesson is basically that um, is that uh, uh, traditional textbook publishers are generally not interested in new ideas. And even many many non-traditional publishers they're not interested in new ideas why because they're very conservative they're very conservative uh you think that uh, textbooks are expensive to buy imagine how expensive they are to produce and a textbook publisher or, or a regular publisher can't afford to put out a loser product on the market. So if they look at it and they can't imagine that somebody's going to uh, buy a copy, they're really, really not interested. So the, the advice for you though, the good news is find other outlets for new ideas. And this is probably what I'll do with this project. I'll probably go on and, and create an ebook out of it or something like that, put it up on, uh, put it up on, uh, Amazon and other places for people to download for small fee and uh, and won't my publishers be jealous when I sell billions of copies yeah who knows yeah <laughs> maybe not okay in any case in any case textbooks generally have a different publishing rules than fiction or, or any other new things and those rules are fairly easy to understand and I'd like to go through some of them with you um, so I'd like to talk about seven steps and um, just a reminder for some of you watching, this will be available as video afterwards. So if you're madly scribbling down some ideas, then it's okay. You can actually uh, get a copy of the video afterwards as well if you'd like to review anything or, or if I speak too quickly for you. Okay, so let's continue. So let's, let's look at some of these seven steps. Um, first one is to do with market needs. So a publisher has to identify some kind of a market need for the books. Um, and those market needs often are new market needs if, for example, there are changes to society in some way, or if there are changes to pedagogy, uh, the teaching. Uh, sometimes uh, there are changes to technology. And the one you see below, of course, are telephones. Like, that's new. And uh, I, I just am constantly amazed when I go into public places how many people are looking at their phone and then of course I find myself looking at my phone as well it's uh, the phone has become a ubiquitous uh, part of our, our 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 lives and and the technology available through it more importantly the access to the World Wide Web and other apps and things like that has kind of changed the world a bit right here's an example from a few years ago from 1994 I think and this was uh, David Noonan David Noonan was my PhD advisor but he's also an extremely influential writer. He uh, he he started off writing uh, mostly textbooks about teaching. Uh, teaching and learning. Uh, interesting guy, come, came from a very, very sort of humble background in a mining town in the middle of Australia. Not a rich family, anything else. The only one of his class of 80 students uh, to escape the town and go on and, and get out and not go into the mines or, or marry locally. So he left and got an education. And uh, I think partly because of that, he has a very plain spoken way of expressing himself that is great for us as teachers when we're reading his his, uh, his methodology textbooks. But he was asked to write, he was asked to write a textbook for students and basically put his theories uh, where his mouth were, so to speak. And uh, for him, he was at the right place in the right time. And a few things happened to, to make that work. First of all, there were a lot of new audiences Suddenly, it was becoming a great vogue to learn English because people were becoming so much more mobile. So people were traveling and immigrating more, and, and uh, so they needed some new met methodologies. That's the second point, the communicative approach uh was uh, was already sort of becoming established but there weren't there weren't very many communicative approach textbooks some said that they were but they were not they were not and uh, my own graduate students review textbooks as partly as as one of the 
tasks in one of my courses that I teach. And it's amazing how many places, how many books will say, yes, the communicative approach, and they're clearly not. They're often audio lingual or something else. So it was a book that really worked on that. He introduced video, so there we have new technology. So the technology was changing as well. Uh, and so back then, of course, you would get VHS tapes with your, <laughs> with, your, uh, with your book of Atlas. But the most, probably the biggest influence was he uh, was in the design. And Heinle and Heinle, who published this book, they, uh, they made a radical, radical decision. They were tired of what was being done by their in-house designers. So they, they just thought differently and they took it to an advertising company that mostly did things like annual reports for big corporations. And they said, what do you think you could do with this stuff? That advertising agency had no preconceived notions of what it should look like. They just wanted to make it look beautiful and accessible and easy to read. They brought in actors and they photographed them extensively in all different sort of configurations, so many things. And it's really all the work done in Atlas has influenced more or less every textbook since then. So these are, this is it made it enormously successful for for him and of course he went on to write many other books. Um, uh, what changes are we seeing today? What's, what, what, what waves can we jump on today? Well, uh, with society we're seeing new waves of immigration. In, in Canada we're seeing, for example, a great number of Syrian immigrants. Is anyone ca uh, uh, catering to their needs? Uh, a little bit. I just I saw something at, uh, I was at the University of Winnipeg um, at a conference at uh, uh, Canadian Mennonite University. Actually, there was a conference held there by the by the Manitoba TESOL organization. And there was somebody doing something with uh, Arabic, uh, sort of uh, kind of almost like flashcards for teaching. Great stuff, right? Taking advantage of that. Pedagogy, blended learning is new, flipped classrooms is new. Uh, do we have the textbooks to support that? I don't know, right? Maybe you could be the one to write it. Technology, podcasts, somebody just mentioned blogs, absolutely. Uh, apps, uh, social media, all these things are being done to a certain extent, but is there a new angle that you can find? Or is there a new technology that's coming out, such as virtual reality or augmented reality that could somehow be used in this way? Those are the changes we're seeing today, and we have to look into these. But, 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 consider the moral of the disposable toilet brush. <laughs> okay, so this is a crazy little story, but when my wife and I were uh, uh, young parents uh, living in Hong Kong, we had another friend who had young kids that we made friends with. Uh, she was in finance, and uh, he was uh, an architect, but the most boring, boring job for any architect. He did plans of, like, when you had a 55-story office building he was planning out like where do the electric plugs go on each floor and, and where are the room dividers and everything else oh it's a terrible terrible job but he and what he really wanted to do was become an inventor so he's always coming up with these crazy ideas for inventions. Anyway, so one day he went away uh, with his wife and family and they went to somewhere, somewhere in Asia, I can't remember which country, but they were renting a house or something for, uh, for a week by the beach or for three weeks by the beach. So anyway, they went into the house, but it hadn't been cleaned properly. And the toilet was disgusting. It was awful. And so she got out the toilet brush and it was disgusting and awful and she just casually mentioned to him she said you know i wish there was a disposable sort of you know toilet brush oh 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 the lights went off he got so excited he thought oh oh that would be such a great invention and basically he spent uh three weeks and he i, I think a compulsive addictive uh behavior uh but he spent three weeks talking about these doing endless drawings solving problems you know throwing away one drawing taking out another one and so on and so forth and this was before the time of the internet. So this is pre-1994. And uh, so anyway, finally they arrive back in Hong Kong and he thinks he's going to become a billionaire with this new idea. And so uh, at this point, he goes into the grocery store and sees, oh, there's already 36 different brands of to disposable toilet cleaners. <laughs> so it essentially ruined his entire vacation. And I could just imagine that uh, she was ready to divorce him soon afterwards. But what's the lesson? If you don't use or read textbooks or whatever books you would like to write, and that could be hard when romances, I don't care. Uh, you could be spy novels or, or Harry Potter novels. If you don't read the stuff and use the
the stuff that you want to write. Don't try to write them, right? You have to be involved with it. You have to do your research of some kind and, and get a little bit more involved and know all about it. If he was interested in the toilet bowl cleaning industry or something beforehand, it would have been a natural thing. But it wasn't. It wasn't. Yeah. OK, the second point, it's all about solutions. So a publisher explores solutions. What is the competition doing? How are teachers currently coping? Is there a bright light? And by that I mean a, a wonderful teacher who's innovating in an unusual way. And again, is there a market for all of this? Well, let's start with the market because that's quite important. Now, I write a lot of different kinds of books, and uh, I write something, I've written one book at the sort of graduate and PhD level, and I write a lot of books for everything else, uh, secondary school, primary school, uh, uh, university level sort of books. So, uh, you know, all the other levels. But what I prefer to write is something for the lower levels. Why? Because there's more of them. There's more students at the primary level. So, uh, so an example of this is actually two books that I wrote. There's a penguin active readers, Theseus and the Minotaur, and uh, probably took me probably took me about a month to write. They seem simple, but I tell you, they, it's enormously complicated. You have to be absolutely on point with language demands for grammar, vocabulary, the grading of it, everything else, the complexity of the sentences. It is complicated, and you have a very very restricted word uh, vocabulary list to use. Uh, on the other hand, I also wrote another book. Again, this is at the master's or doctoral level, teaching research in computer assisted language learning, which I've done a second edition of as well. And that probably took eight up about five years of my life. Of course, I was writing and doing other things at the, on the side, but it really was enormously, uh, 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 more enormously demanding to write something like that. Um, well, here's the thing. Uh, the Theseus and the Minotaur was like 22 pages. That's it. It's 22 pages. Skinny little book, right? Uh, the the computer-assisted language learning one has 24 pages of references, and that's a very small point. A huge amount of work, huge amount of work. And, and the book itself is, I don't know, 250 pages or something like that, or 350 pages, I have to look. But uh, the, the point is, is I've actually made about 10 times as much money on Theseus and the Minotaur and I have on the computer-assisted language learning one. Why? Well, it's because there's uh, so many more students worldwide who want to read about Theseus and the Minotaur compared to the few graduate students who uh, read about the other one. Okay, um, often uh, this is my friend Julia Williams, and she was the originator of, of the LEAP series that I work on. And uh, sometimes teachers are frustrated. Uh, she was frustrated teaching English for academic purposes, and she wasn't finding anything helpful in the market. She would have loved to have just bought a, t uh, a textbook, and I think if she could have, she never would have done uh, any work herself on creating one, right? So, but she had to basically start creating her own materials to fill in the gaps. So she ended up with a pile of notes or something like that. And then, you know, was talking to uh, reps sometime and they became kind of interested in this possible gap in the market. And uh, that was that gave birth to her the first version of learning English for academic purposes. Right. So that's what happens. Uh, there's a little asterisk after cohesive books there. Now, the important part here is if they don't reinvent the wheel, that means if they don't just do something that's already existing out there. And again, Again, it's all about the research. So uh, another example of another author is uh, the famous uh, Carolyn Graham. Now, Graham had this insight that American jazz had parallel stress and rhythm patterns to American English. Now, she, is, uh, she was uh, uh, an ESL teacher at Columbia University, but she was also a, a jazz musician, quite talented uh, pianist and singer. And so she was very, very interested in music. And of course, she woke up one day and just thought, why can't I put those two things together? So she started to do it in her classroom and eventually put together some materials, was probably speaking at conferences and things, and uh, Oxford approached her. So again, this, this uh, methodology of exaggerating the stress and rhythm, students internalize uh, pronunciation, vocabulary, and grammar in a fun way. If you don't know about Jazz Chance, you should look at it. Um, Brenda uh, Brenda's saying that it's a classic, and I agree, yeah, it definitely is. In fact, it's also a license to print money. <laughs> it, is so, it is so much money 
money I think that she's made from this because she just did, used the same idea but kept applying it to fairy tales, to grammar, to holiday themes, to Mother Goose and uh, and uh, other ones. So, and this is a very small selection of the long list for adults, for young children, everything. Just really a fantastic, fantastic idea. So this is something original and something new, right? So what's the fourth lesson? Writers are chosen for who they are quite often. So you have to be academic, you have to be professional, and of course social really helps as well, but also review and expand your skills. So think about, well, what skills do I have? And they don't just have to be writing skills. There are lots of people around, I think, who are better at writing than me, who are better at grammar than me, who are better at many things than me, but you need a little combination of skills to be successful. And promotion is one of them. Okay, so the third point has to do with the writer. So a publisher has to identify a writer for a new project. Uh, it has to do with Catch-22. Um, there's certain qualities of a textbook writer, and there's certain ways in which potential writers are chosen. From my perspective, and I'm not an expert, I'm not representing every publisher in the world here. These are just personal, and I apologize for the personal focus on this, but that's what I know best. So Catch-22 is basically if you don't need it, you can't have it. If you do need it, <laughs> you can't have it. Uh, or in publishing, it's basically if you've never done it before, no one wants to give you a chance. You know, publishing a book can be a million dollar proposition. They don't want to just take somebody off the street who says, hey, I think I could do that. Uh, they want to know, they want to have some confidence that you can do that. Part of that is uh, starting people off on simpler or smaller projects and then building up in some way. So what are the qualities of a textbook writer? And looking at this page, looking at this picture, you probably think, oh, you have to be an idiot. <laughs> That's not true. Okay, so uh, this was actually for uh, a talk that I gave in Bulgaria on uh, Rapunzel. So I brought along the wig. Yeah, I love to entertain. I like to actually make things memorable. That's my whole focus in teaching and learning. Okay, but each writer is different, but a writer, I think, should know his subject, uh, know the subject and the students, know the market, uh, know how to write and uh, be creative, be critical, be flexible and take, uh, be able to take criticism. Uh, I, I go through things where I write an entire chapter, I'll spend a week of my life, I send it in, the editor says, says, you know what, I think this theme is just not really working. And what do I say? Well, I don't say I'm going to kill you and burn down your house. I say, of course, no problem. And I just do it, I just do it. Uh, you have to be flexible, you have to take criticism, and you have to be willing to write over and over again if somebody, uh, if somebody wants to, you to. Um, you have to be able to work with a range of other professionals is also very important. So how are writers, we'll come back to that, but how are writers chosen? Well, again, I can speak from personal experience. Um, I went and gave a presentation at a conference. It was my first conference. I was living in Beijing and I went to Hong Kong to a conference and it was the, only the second conference I think I'd ever attended, but I was presenting and I was so nervous and excited. And uh, there was a woman who came to introduce me just as uh, Catherine Ebert introduced me this evening. So we had to meet and uh, and then she found out a little bit about me, introduced me, and then she sat through the lecture and she saw something she liked. She liked my presentation style. She thought that I was a convincing and compelling uh, speaker. And afterwards, we sort of had a drink and we started talking, but I was living in Beijing. She was in Hong Kong. Turns out she was the editorial director for Oxford University Press. So, uh, a year later, my wife and I, we moved to Hong Kong and uh, I just sort of reconnected with her, not on any professional expectation whatsoever, but just because she was a very funny, uh, hilarious sort of Scottish woman and uh, we got to meet her husband, who was a professor at uh, Hong Kong University. I started working at City University of Hong Kong and after a year after that, she said, Ken, Ken, would you be interested in writing something for us? I said, yeah, sure, Fiona. And she was really looking for somebody not with experience in my case, but uh, somebody who she thought maybe could promote the books and somebody who um, could take direction. So anyway, it was a miracle. It was a miracle. I wrote these six tiny little books, six tiny, tiny little books, 36 to 48 pages each. And, uh, and then what happened? And then every single student in Hong Kong from grades one to six was forced to buy these books every year for 12 years. And during that time, they took them to Shanghai. And in Shanghai, most of the students in Shanghai 
Um, I'm not, I'm not going to get into, you know, dollars and cents and things like that. But I can just tell you, when I moved back to Canada, we paid cash for our house. It was just, uh, it was just a miracle of, uh, of uh, money making things. But that's not always the case. That's not always, I was very, very lucky. It was my first book series. And really, I had no idea what I was doing. I made so many mistakes, but I had careful editors who took care of me. Doesn't always work that way. Um, a few years later, the editor who'd worked on that project with me, not this woman who hired me, but, uh, but um, uh, a local uh, editor, she moved to uh, another company. And uh, she said, hey, hey, here's another idea. Let's let's do this for China. And she had this idea listening with Ting Ting, a little panda and funny little illustrations and everything else. And I wrote an eight book series on this. Did not sell a single copy. I don't know why. I don't know why. It was very similar to what I'd written in Hong Kong didn't sell a single copy. I think there was other competition at this time. It is, she thought that it should be very cheap to buy. So it was only single color, uh, brown on white paper, things like that. So it was a disaster. And it gets worse, even worse, even worse. Um, years later, um, one of my friends owns one of the largest uh, um, toy companies in the world. And he asked me to do some cons consulting for him. And I did that for a couple of years. I named all the characters and wrote up little scenarios. And so when you buy Buy the box of these toys. Um, they would often, you know, have my writing on the back of it and and uh, little scenarios, little things like that that I did. And I did some co other sorts of consulting. Anyway, we were sitting around dinner one day, and I said, uh, you know, one idea would be, you know, uh, for parents uh, because they were talking about how to expand in the market. Well, they already sell 173 million boxes of toys a year. It is a big company, um, so they. Uh, they sorry they have 50,000 employees uh, in, in factories in China uh, so anyway so they uh, they said uh, I said hey how about a book they loved the idea they loved the idea so I, I wrote four books there's just three of them here and uh, they were lovely little stories engaging they're very moral uh, and uh, you know taught kids about you know kindness and friendship and, and good things and helping others and helping sick dinosaurs and things like that or dinosaurs in trouble so it was all these great things and I wrote these books and and you can see that of course he had illustrators he just had them all you know done up and everything else and uh, then they took them uh, one of their principal uh, clients is uh, for example Toys R Us was back then and uh, no not interested <laughs> And that was it. That was it. Never printed, not even a copy. I spent all that time doing this. I'm so sad because they were beautiful stories. So this happens as well. Um, but how, are, how, how else are, are they chosen? So I, I told you that I gave a conference, but um, something else happened. I left Hong Kong. We were traveling. My wife and I decided to take the boys. We left Hong Kong before we moved back to Canada. We took three and a half months to travel through Southeast Asia. And I was in Australia and um, I got an uh, email and uh, uh, a woman at Longman said, hey, would you mind coming to uh, Ho Chi Minh City next week? Um, we're having a management conference. We'd just like you to give a little talk. I said, okay, all right, are you sure? I, you know I'm in Australia, I'm not in Hong Kong anymore. Yeah, 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 it's okay, just get in the plane, we'll pay for everything. I said, okay, that's fine. So I went to Ho Chi Minh City and they asked, they said, can you talk about listening? And I said, sure. So I put together a very, very fun presentation. It was very, very funny because it was also, because they were all native speakers and uh, high level of English and they had, um, I, uh, I did some very theatrical things, got the uh, got the uh, managers up on stage doing crazy things and stuff. It was really fun. But, but, but the reason I realized after they had asked me to do this is because they were looking for an author for a new series that they had in planning. So they basically it was a kind of a trial. And this is, I think, quite common quite common. So they sort of thought, does he know anything about listening? So again, I talked very convincingly about it. And then I ended, they ended up asking me, say, would you like to write this book? And the title became Sounds Good, four book series, still sold. And then uh, another time, uh, uh, back in Canada, I was asked by uh, Pearson in Canada. I said, oh, you know, would you like to go to Whistler? Who wouldn't? And uh, we're giving a three-day, uh, we'd like you to give a three-day sort of workshop with teachers. I said, yeah, I'm all over that. So uh, so they hired me for that and uh, nice hotels, everything else. And then, um, and then afterwards, they asked me to do a materials review of Leap, of, uh, of the book that... Uh, 
had already been written for Leap. And that turned into uh, me starting to write some of the Leap books. And now I write, you know, quite a few of the Leap books. So that seems to be a major thing that I've done. So asking somebody to do a review of a book can sometimes read into that. You're, they're looking for your insights, your ideas, what you like about the book, what you might do differently. And if it resonates with them, then that helps, right? Um, I wrote something else, another sort of thing that comes out is I wrote something academic a number of years ago, actually, a number of year, years ago. And then two years ago, I got a phone call from a publisher. I can't say who, I can't say where, uh, but they said, oh yeah, we sort of uh, interested in seeing you. And then they came to see me at a conference and uh, see me present and took me out for a very nice lunch and then asked me to uh, join another project. And that's what I'm doing now. So again, I can't talk about it secret, but again, part of the idea is, I was doing something academic and I wasn't intending it to be about uh, teaching but or be about writing or publishing, but it turned out that way. Okay, so the fifth lesson is being chosen to write a book and making money is mostly a matter of luck. So, of course, the, the advice is write early and write often, you know, try a lot of different things. And my own, my own work with those uh, 130, actually 140 books now uh, that I've written uh, is a kind of a scattershot approach so that uh, some will make money, some will not make any money. Uh, but in the end, I am able to, you know, support my family and... Uh, and uh, send my kids to university. Okay, meet the team. Uh, fourth point, authors don't work alone. They have a lot of support, but with that support comes high expectations and deadlines. So you have to perform. However, there's amazing food. <laughs> They're all on expense accounts and take you out to a wonderful restaurant. So that's the best part. You're not alone. And I was asked, actually asked at a BCTO conference at uh, Vancouver Island University a few years ago to talk about a similar topic. And um, I asked my editor, I said, how many people are involved in this leap book that I'm working on? And she did the math and came back with 27. In fact, the books that I'm working on now, there's even more people. Uh, this, the big, this, uh, I won't talk about the new project, but uh, there's probably 50 people working on that. So uh, interesting. Uh, you're just uh, one part of the mil middle. But uh, part of the wisdom in this whole thing is uh, comes from this old one from Hegel who said, no man is a hero to his valet, right? The valet smells, uh, has to take off his shoes and, and, and smell his smelly feet or something like that. But uh, uh, the, this, the sixth lesson is no writer is a genius in the eyes of an editor. Right? So you think you're you think you're a great writer. I think I'm smart. I think I know grammar. I teach, you know, university. I teach doctoral students and stuff and oh man, you know, uh, my editors find things that I've done that are so embarrassing. Um, so the advice here is worship editors and learn from them. Uh, so use everything as an opportunity to continue learning. Um, the fifth point is the writing cycle. So it's very complicated and very long. And I've got a picture of an iceberg here because, you know, metaphorically, there's nine tenths of the iceberg is underwater. And that's what you don't see when you buy a textbook and uh, you don't see all the work that goes into it. It starts off with setting deadlines. They've got a publishing thing. They're going to they're going to print in one year or two years. They review market information and they're always collecting market information. And you could be one of those people giving it to the publishers because they often ask. Uh, create a scope and sequence. Uh, what is taught? When it's taught? Uh, a sample chapter. You have to get some. You get feedback on the sample chapter from the market. We send it out. We get it back. They say it's terrible. We like this. We don't like this. Why aren't you doing this? It's too easy. It's too difficult. Things like that. And then after all that's done, even uh, when it's all done, then you have to create all now these days, all the online components, which is huge, huge amount of work for me to do, but it's part of the product. So um, once you do start writing, you will be, uh, somebody will say this to you, why write a book when you can buy one for 20 bucks? <laughs> you get this all the time. And uh, the other one is every time you go to a party, somebody will say, uh, I'm going to write a book one day. And of course, you know, yes, and I'm going to do brain surgery as well. Most people do not end up writing books. Um, okay, so what's an example? What's an example of how difficult it is to write a book? Well, here's something that looks insanely easy. This is Starship English, a series that I wrote with an Australian publisher that was then sold to an American publisher and is now doing very well, uh, Ecuador. 
uh, has just the Ministry of Education in Ecuador has just adopted it as the uh, textbook for all schools, grades one to six. So uh, yeah, it's fantastic for me. Anyway, so here, look simple. Look, listen, and talk. Hello, my name's Star. What's your name? My name's Tessa. How do you spell Tessa? T-E-S-S-A. Hi, my name's Dan. Hi, my name's Star. Uh, her name's Stella. Simple. My friend, I remember getting these books in the mail and coming in a big box when they were first published. And my best friend Chris comes over and says, Oh, and looks through them. And I said, Chris, look at this. He says, Oh, these look easy to write. I think, No, Chris, no, it's difficult, difficult. That one page, that one page probably took us uh, three weeks of meetings just going through. It was excruciating. I spent five years on this project, you know, basically going every single detail. And when you look at that first page, Age. I'm trying to teach capitalization, contractions, greetings, pronouns, proper nouns, possessive pronouns, a punctuation, question, answer, statement structures, and spell it out conventions, T-E-S-S-A. All of those are deliberate choices, but everything is a choice in a textbook. And you have to sit around a table, you have to propose things as an author, and then you have to take uh, feedback. Curiously, this was an interesting project in part because uh, after I'd been working on it for about a year, uh, the uh, the uh, publisher said, yeah, we're very happy with what you're doing, Ken. You know, there was two other people who were working on this before you came. They hired someone, they fired them. They hired another woman, very, very well established and stuff. She didn't know what she was talking about. She had monkey bars, said, monkey bars. They've been, they've been, and this was part of it because I was asked to review the materials and monkey bars have been illegal in Canada for 20 years. And nobody has monkey bars anymore, right? Jungle gyms, yes. So things like that. So lesson seven is find a place to insert yourself into the processing press. The first point is talk to your publisher reps, especially if you're using their books. Talk to them, let them know what you're doing. Invite them into your classroom sometimes. They love that sort of thing. Uh, get to know them a little bit and they're the ones who are going to recommend you. Marketing. Marketing is very important. When you write a book, there's only one person who may not make any money off it. <laughs> now, I think you know who that is. It's the writer. So uh, so uh, everybody else, you know, in, in, in the offices with the publishers that I write with, they all get a salary. They all get holiday pay. They have pensions. They have, you know, health insurance. They've got everything else and things like that. But the but the, if a book fails if a, or if it's not marketed properly, or extensively enough, the person who really, really loses is the writer and nobody else. So um, all blame also falls on the writer if there are mistakes in the book. So you also have to pay a lot of attention. So I review every single page of everything that goes in, even though I've got, again, the books, when I write the leap books, we have three levels of editors. But despite having three levels of editors, I saw in one book with another publisher that I was doing, they flipped a map. The designer just flipped a map because it looked nicer on the page. I thought, you can't flip maps. You know, there's no way it's not backwards. You're not standing at the center of the earth looking at it. So things like that. So you have to take charge and promote yourself. I do this in a number of ways, uh, actively and passively. So actively is, of course, I go to a conference, I bring out the books, I do a workshop, I visit a university or school. I try to do that. And I, I put myself out there to do that. Uh, passively as well. Uh, so I've got a website, for example, and, and just promote some of the stuff that I'm doing, shares my books, but other things as well. I do YouTube videos. So I've done lots and lots of YouTube videos, and this is an example of one uh, that's going to be out there. So then again, somebody gets to know me and maybe they buy a book or maybe I get hired for my next uh, writing job or for something else. Who knows? You never know. I can't. I don't bank on it, but it's again, it increases the chances in some way. I write blogs. So uh, I just finished, uh, what was it? Q is for questions, right? <laughs> so I've written, been writing through the alphabet. And I do this for always ESL newsletter out of uh, Pearson, New York. And this is just published uh, every month or a couple of months or something like that when I get around to it. Uh, I publish a little blog and article just about teaching. Um, so lesson eight is look for ways to promote yourself and your work and give back to the community while you do. So uh, I do a lot of I do a lot of webinars and I get paid a lot of money to do webinars, but I don't get paid tonight. I'm doing this because I'm a member of BC Teal and I take great pride in that. I'm on the board of directors. I want to help out and I have a, a sense of improving my profession. And so should you. If you're not a member of BC Teal, you should join or join some other uh, uh, organization if you're in another area in some way. Yeah. OK, so number seven, this is the uh, probably the most important one. And it's also the shortest one. Never stop learning. 
never stop learning. You can't give up. This is this is ha this Halloween actually. This is my Halloween costume, right? Um, uh, so you you can't stop learning. You have to be curious. So lesson nine is be curious. Never stop learning about your discipline. Step outside of your comfort zone. Try to learn some new skills. And and think things that might do uh, something to help you later on. If you're young and interested in computers and interested in publishing, my goodness, learn to code. Learn to code. Create an app. Do something like that. You know, that's going to be a new thing. Or maybe there's something else. Maybe you're going to illustrate the books that you do. I don't know. Whatever it is, step outside of your comfort zone to push yourself to keep learning. Every city I go to, I go to the art galleries, I go to the museums if I have time. And uh, that enriches me. Talk to people. Talk to people that you know maybe would be a little nervous about talking to because they're professionals, or talk to people maybe who are in the classroom, who might have something to offer you or could learn from you. Whatever, it's going to help. Okay, so there's a traditional publishers, and I know many of you are sort of crying your eyes out, thinking I'll never make it with a traditional publisher. Don't worry, don't worry. There's actually many, many other options beyond traditional publishers, and these are becoming very, very exciting. So we really, really want to uh, we really want to sort of consider some of these. And myself, I'm considering some of these as well, even though I have a lot of connections with publishers, but they won't publish my Z to B book. So anyway, how else can you get published? Uh, on the very, very smallest level, you can actually print your own book. And this is actually called the Espresso Book Machine. It's at uh, it's at uh, Powell's Books in Portland. And uh, I love this. I'd read about it before, but I'd never seen one. It takes, I think, about 20 minutes or something, but you give it a Word file and it prints an entire book and it puts a cover on it, everything else, but only a single copy, right? And it's not cheap. But, uh, but again, if you really want to be published, you want to have that one book <laughs> casually on your... <laughs> on your on your coffee table in your living room that you wrote you can do it this way yeah go ahead um, you can also create simple ebooks so again if you've got materials uh, it's easy to create an ebook based on a word document so if you type you write you've got questions in there you've got illustrations whatever you want to put in depending on what your skill set is again you can make an, a PDF ebook and then you can sell that you can sell that through you know uh, amazon.com and different things there's lots of lots of websites uh, where you can get help uh, uh, with these sorts of ideas. Another one uh, that's a little more exciting is uh, for those of you who are Apple uh, uh, Mac users is Apple iBooks author. And the reason that this is interesting is because you can create books for the iPad or for other computer devices. I don't know, maybe phones as well. But the exciting thing is, is they have a host of little tools for creating interactivity. So you can see the example here. Uh, you've got um, you've got uh, 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 a, a multiple choice question. It's with photos, but you've got multiple choice questions. So if you're writing an educational textbook and you want to have some pictures, you can put in video and sound and everything else into this. You could create a really engaging little program. Now, a few years ago, Korea, the Ministry of Education, announced that they were going to replace all textbooks in all the schools with uh, Samsung tablets. And basically, all the publishers would have to do that. Hasn't happened yet, may still happen, may not. But again, I think it is the direction of the future. So again, you know, if you've got some extra time, why not learn how to do this, right? I have. I did something, a fun side project as well. But no time for that. Okay, a little bit of time. Uh, one of my friends, uh, he um, he had young kids as well, and he, we were we were complaining about the lack of adventures for young kids, and how young boys are so you know netted in about you know be safe, you know make sure you've got your bicycle helmet on, don't do anything dangerous, you know that sort of thing. You know, I, I do I do advocate bicycle helmets, of course, and force my own children to wear them. But he was sort of talking about that, so we started doing uh, crazy ideas about what could we do with our kids. So we took them out, and we would you know go to the beach, isolated beach, and we'd build a, a sauna sort of on the beach with you know driftwood and plastic, which we would then take back with us. We built catapults um, large enough to, you know, uh, do rocks like the size of your head and uh, all sorts of different things like that. And I started creating a little iBook. After a while, we just ran out of steam and, and we we didn't do any more with it. But I, I, I did it more or less just really to learn how to use the, the program. So it's interesting. There's something you could do there. Um, a really exciting one is teachers pay teachers. And the amazing thing about this one is sometimes all you need is one page. Like if you had a one page idea for like a teaching rubric or some sort of teaching idea, you can put it up on teachers pay teachers. 
I don't know, charge 99 cents for it or something like that. Other teachers do much more complicated things, how to teach, you know, particular subject or a particular thing to do with, say, grammar. Or you might have like one special lesson where you do something really amazing and it's got some visual aids or things like that that they could photocopy. You can do that. Um, this this woman, um, I forget her last name. Her last name's Jump, but she was uh, she is uh, she's uh, uh, a kindergarten teacher in Atlanta, Georgia, at a Christian school, and she became the first millionaire uh, from Teachers Pay Teachers. She has ninety three lessons, uh, ninety three lessons available that she's created, and she sells them online, and people go crazy and buy them, and it's an international thing. And she basically, all she's doing is she's saving teachers time. So she's done all the work thinking about, oh yeah, how could you teach, you know, numbers, or how can you teach the seasons, or what would be a great way to teach about, you know, a holiday like Christmas. So she has all this stuff there, and then people buy it, right? And she, uh, and she became a millionaire doing this. So again, uh, this is, uh, I'm, I'm frantically busy with a little, a couple of different, uh, three different projects right now. But when I'm sort of, you know, sort of have a, a time to breathe, I sort of think, yeah, I should do some of this. I've got some great ideas I could put up there maybe, and who knows? Again, it might turn into something. The last one is is really to become a publisher yourself. And if you've been to the BC uh, TO conference, you've probably met um, uh, the the two lovely. It's an older couple from Grassroots Press, and they're really really a charming uh, couple. And they have uh, they sell actually a number of books by other publishers, but they also develop their own books. And I put up the one Rick Hansen here because it does something. Special. It does something special. It, Rick Hansen is not something that's you're going to sell as a book in a big way in China or South America or England or something like that. This is a big issue for uh, Canadians, and we're trying to promote that. So that's a great thing. So again, you could become your own publisher and maybe work with other teachers. So the 10th lesson is explore a range of publishing options. Consider working with others whose skill sets complement your own. Meet a designer, meet a meet a illustrator, meet a, uh, somebody who's good on the web or things like that. Maybe you can work together and do something interesting. Okay, publishing can be an emotionally and financially rewarding. Uh, but uh, reflect on your reasons why are you doing it. Uh, what are your skills? Uh, what are your ambitions to learn and to keep learning about the craft as well as you know the content? And what's your willingness to fail? Because things don't always go well. So you kind of have to sort of think about that. Okay, so I hope this has been useful, um, but I just have to have a little warning at the end of this because I get asked this a lot of times at conferences. I cannot hear your ideas. Why? First, I'll probably just steal them and write them myself, or I might be working on something similar, and then in six months you'll say, hey, Ken Beattie just came out with my idea, and uh, when it wasn't your idea at all, and then you'll come and burn down my house. Uh, I can't mentor or advise. I've got 120 students in our, in our graduate students and doctoral students in our program. I work with them. I can't do more. I've got to portion my time. Uh, I don't want to review or help you in other ways with your stuff. I'm not in that role. Uh, I'm not going to share contacts or introduce you to publishers. Uh, and uh, however, and I don't want to collaborate with other writers. Uh, but if you have some wildly different uh, skill set than mine, for example, if you're an opera composer having a great idea for teaching uh, English through opera, man, I'd really be interested in that. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I hope I'm not sounding like a terrible person, but I'm freelance and I have to work carefully with my time. Okay, so now we might have a little bit of uh, time for questions. Any questions, anyone? Yeah? Everyone still want to be a writer? <laughs> I can't. I can't. <laughs> Any questions? Everyone's shy, yeah. Nobody wants to share their big idea. <laughs> Instead, no opera, no opera aficionados. Oh, I guess not, yeah. I actually did write an opera when I was doing my master's degree. I wrote an opera for the Canadian Opera Company, just a one hour one, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, Karen has an interesting question here. Okay, here's a question. What's What are my thoughts on open textbooks? Um, First of all, uh, people often say, well, oh, yes, textbooks are too expensive. But I hope that you've got a little bit of a sense of how much work goes into creating a textbook and the enormous risk that every publisher takes in putting one out on the shelf. 
you know, it, again, if things don't sell, they take a dive and, and that costs them enormous amounts of money. So they're, they're, they're actually cooperative partners in developing materials to teach our students. And if you take away all the motivation for them for doing so, then I don't know, that's kind of problematical. I think that where uh, open textbooks have been most popular have been in areas such as mathematics that seem not to have changed a great deal or, you know, in the last five centuries. Uh, or things like novels, which, you know, if you've got an old copy of Shakespeare, really, why do you need to buy, if you can get it online, why need, do you need to do that? But if you think about the, when I think about the work that I do and the constant challenges that I get from teachers and the input and the feedback we get from teachers and how that makes us do new editions of things, uh, I sort of see that uh, our, it's an evolving thing. I mean, really, if people don't want it, that's fine. But uh, I think that we do give value for money. And, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, students, you know, think about that it's so expensive, the textbooks. But I think back in, when I went to university, uh, in my first year, I remember my tuition fee was $324, $317. And my textbooks were $324. So if you bring that up now, are, are students still paying more for textbooks than they are for tuition? Probably not, not for, per year. So uh, I think that it's it's kind of a perception. Um, you know, kids who, kids who uh, um, you know, I was told that by one, one professor, he said, these kids who, were, who drive up in a Lamborghini, but they don't want to pay for a book. You know, it's like, okay, you know, you have to have some priorities there. So my thoughts on open textbooks is I, I, I don't see it as being something that really helps the students in many ways. I think you ended up with some very dated and simplistic materials that aren't that good. Yeah. Brenda says, uh, with publishers, is a matter of somehow being invited or continually knocking on doors? I don't think they like knocking on doors. Um, I think it is more about being invited, but the best way to be invited is to get to know them. So if you really wanted to be involved, I think you start off by going to the conferences, meeting the rat, reps, introducing yourselves and saying, listen, I, I, I'd be open to uh, reviewing materials or doing something like that. So for example, again, it requires that you're actually using textbooks in your class. And I've been to many classrooms where uh, they say, oh, yes, well, we just photocopy whatever we need. And I think, OK, well, that person's never going to work with a publisher, right? But if you're using a text, any textbook, any publisher, maybe use that as your entry point. Go to the publishers at the conference or just call up your local publisher and say, hey, listen, I'm using your book. I've got some ideas about what I like and what I don't like. Do you want me to just write that up for you? They would love that. They love that sort of feedback. And that is the sort of thing I know people have been hired ba based on that because they get into a conversation and a relationship. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes a while. So that's that's one good start for all of you. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, an entry point somewhere. Yeah, I think that's good. Another one with my own students. Um, uh, I, I think you probably all know the blue book, the uh, blue grammar book uh, by Azar. Uh, Stacy Hagen has uh, taken over that now, and um, and uh, Az uh, Betty Azar has sort of retired. But um, uh, Stacy Hagen started off by going at a conference up to um, Betty Azar and having a little conversation with her about the things they got on and and Betty Azar said oh you know after a while uh, said oh would you like to do help me out with this and write a very very tiny small part of something and and uh, Stacy said sure now Stacy is in charge of the whole shooting match yeah and so I was thinking about that and one of my students one of my own graduate students did um, a review of the blue book and she put down all the things of, of Stacy Hagen's book and all the things and I said hey you know after she, she did it I said you know what Stacy's a friend of mine I said uh, how would if I send this to her and she said, oh, OK. So I went through it again. And then we sent it to Stacy. And uh, I just saw Stacy a couple of weeks ago at a conference in uh, Seattle. And yeah, she really appreciated that. So who knows? I mean, I'm not saying Stacy's then going to hire that woman to become the next Betty Azar. But it doesn't it doesn't uh, it doesn't hurt is what I'm saying. So, yeah, it's a chance. Yeah. Do publishers like to publish uh, photocopyable books? Um, uh, uh, Jacqueline, it's a great question. Um, most publishers include some photocopyable elements because teachers like them, and that allows teachers to tailor them in some way. But again, it's the profit uh, motivation. So you think about it, like how much work goes into creating a textbook, 
And then if people are just going to buy it once and then photocopy it for the rest of their lives, then, you know, there's no profit motivation. So the market is really not, it doesn't really work for the publisher very well. So, I mean, you can do that. And I know that some people have done that. There's photocopyable textbooks for, um, for uh, elementary schools in particular with little worksheets that they fill out and things like that. But again, you look at the pyramid, you look at the pyramid, and uh, again, if you're doing that, who are you going to sell to? Well, you're not selling to a whole class. You're selling to one teacher or even just one school, right? So then it's not going to make you any money uh, as an author. Yeah, so there we are. Uh, Karen says, you mentioned that the online components are necessary these days. How challenging are these to develop in terms of finding videos, etc.? Yeah, it's a pain. It's an enormous pain. And I can illustrate this with one horrific example this this week that was just a complete nightmare for me. I just finished a, I just finished a chapter uh and sent it off merrily to my publisher thinking i was so smart and wonderful and i sent it off and then i turned on uh i turned on cnn on sunday night like i sent it seriously i sent it sunday and then monday morning i turned on i looked at the guardian no sunday night still just after i sent it like an hour after i sent it i looked at the guardian and it said charlie rose fired from cbc eight women have come forward with sexual things and thought, oh God, and we had spent months, you know, looking for for video clips, and you know, a little while to find this one. Then we had to get permissions. Then we had to get transcripts. Then I wrote the whole thing, and now we can't use it, right? Yeah. So we're not going to have some sort of sex offender, you know, being profiled in one of the books. So there's a lot of issues about finding things that are on topic, that are current, that are at the right level. Every time we write any, create any, every teacher wants authentic materials. Fantastic. That's great. But actually they don't um, they want authentic materials that are low enough for their students to access and can't be too complicated so we find authentic materials and then they say they're too difficult so which becomes my problem my problem then becomes okay how do I give them something that's very difficult and convince teachers that all right this is really difficult but what you have to do with this is um, you know illustrate that this is what the students may come up against so you need you need some coping strategies. You need some coping strategies uh, with which to deal with this. So let's uh, let's talk about that a little bit differently. Yeah. So um, so it becomes a challenge for me uh, as well. But it is difficult to find. And of course, the other one is uh, another book that I was working on this year, and and a couple of guys, uh, two brothers on YouTube, doing a great travel video sort of thing like that. It came back, you know, the video should have been licensed to us for probably like 500 bucks or something like that. You know, I mean, that's what we might pay. And they wanted like 2,500 or something for it in the US. And I thought, ah, of course, it can't afford that, you know? So there's budgets involved. And so that becomes a difficult thing. So there's a lot of variables that make it very, very difficult to find uh, current, authentic, you know, usable, uh, appropriate materials. Yeah. So there you are. Any other questions? Any other questions? All right. Well, if there's not, then uh, then thank you very very much for uh, joining in the conversation. Uh, I'd like to uh, I'd like to look through the um, comments afterwards and see. Oh, one last question. Linda says uh, I want to make easy readers for my very low level students. Can you recommend an easy to use publishing programs? So far, I've only begun to use MS Publisher. Okay, I would not use MS Publisher, <laughs> but it might work for you or things like that. Um, I guess, you know, it's whatever tool sort of works for you. Um, maybe, I don't know, MS Publisher might work or things like that. I suppose it's what you want it to do and things like that. But I suspect that there's probably other other programs out there. I don't use these programs, of course, because uh, because I have publishers who use high level programs for me that deal with all the uh, deal with everything there. But uh, that might work. Yeah. OK. And I think with that, we'll say good night. And thank you all for attending and taking this time out of your very busy schedules to uh, to be professional, to learn, to continue to uh, develop in your careers. It's a great thing. Yeah. Catherine? Thank you very much, Ken. It was um, inter interesting listening to you speak. And thank you very much for attending, everybody. OK, we're going to shut it down now. Bye bye.